We'll see if I can follow up on all these excellent talks this morning. Very glad to be invited. And um, I uh, think my talk might be a little more pedantic than the other talks, but hopefully that's a good thing, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, what I want to talk about today is hybrid quantum computing. I, this was uh, the topic I was given. And so what I want to do today is give you kind of an overview of all the different things that are interesting about hybrid quantum computing, quantum classical interfaces. Um, I'd like to talk a little about words, talk a little about uh, complexity at the end. Um, and then in between, I'll talk about different approaches people are taking. There's been a lot of work done over the last, uh, over the quarantine period. It's been amazing how many papers have come out. So um, this is really not a complete survey. And, you know, I guess it's almost impossible to do. Even the surveys that I'll mention are not complete themselves because the paper that came out since then. Um, so there's basically no hope of introducing everything. But hopefully this is a good introduction that will help anyone who's interested get started. Um, with that in mind, I have a number of things that I want to get across. So the first thing I want to think about is just this word hybrid quantum classical computing. Now, if we actually believe in quantum mechanics, right, really believe in quantum mechanics in our soul, like all the way from top to bottom, right, then all the devices are quantum. All the molecules, all the materials, everything's quantum. There's nothing that's not quantum, right? I mean, you can imagine things beyond quantum, but there's nothing that's not quantum, right? So everything classical is just an approximation of a quantum system. So with that in mind, we can think of how we might actually parse this idea of hybrid quantum classical um, computing. So we have quantum devices, so these coherent quantum computing devices on one end, um, which would uh, give quantum outputs, take quantum inputs, and, and process quantum information. On the other hand, we have quantum, we have classical conventional computers. I don't like calling them classical computers for this reason that I'm pointing out, that there's really no such thing as classical anything. Right? There's just things that we don't need to use quantum theory for. In any case, uh, ordinary computing devices uh, we'll give some commands or circuits that get sent to a quantum device. The quantum device runs those commands or circuits and gives some output. This is how it has to work, right? Quantum devices are built with electronics, with control electronics. The control electronics are also processed through uh, some sort of device, some sort of ordinary device that's not necessarily quantum. So we're not using quantum devices to control quantum devices. So at every level of any quantum algorithm, it's quantum classical hybrid computing. However, if we're serious about this and we're looking at what people are doing, and this is meant to be an introduction to the ideas and, and things that people are playing around with to kind of open up the entire um, the workshop here. So what people are going to talk about when they say hybrid quantum classical computing is they're talking about hybrid quantum algorithms that make use of quantum classical feedback loops to accomplish their computational goal. So this is a very broad definition of what it means to be hybrid quantum classical computing. And the idea is that this computer that you control is going to give some classical parameters, which will tell the quantum computer what to do, get the output from the quantum computer, and that tells you how to update your classical parameters or how to extract some information or anything of that sort, or maybe how to mitigate errors. There's a lot of things done here. So the entire hybrid quantum classical computing with these feedback loops, you can already imagine that feedback loops allow you to do a lot of things to control, for instance, a reaction or control um, errors. So you can have feedback loops that will really allow you to stabilize the quantum device, to work against the coherence, and it really allows you to get a lot of things done when you allow the quantum and classical device to carry part of the computing together. Uh, people mentioned phase estimation. Phase estimation is an algorithm that's not considered a quantum classical computing, because with phase estimation, you give the entire circuit one time to the quantum device. The quantum device runs, and you might sample from that circuit, but you're not using the outputs to update the circuit. So phase estimation tends not to be um, something of primary focus. This conference is on near-term quantum applications. So um, with that in mind, I'll talk about some very near-term and some very recent work in, that, in those veins. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to, again, I said this talk, the goal of this talk was to be pedantic. So with that in mind, let's just start off with the variational principle. We have a Hamiltonian, and it has a ground state phi zero. Uh, then for any approximate phi, we always have that the energy is higher than the ground state energy. This is the basis for most of our um, methods inside of conventional com computational chemistry, configuration interaction methods, so singles and doubles, and full, configura full configuration interaction are both variational methods. Hartree-Fock and density functional theory, there's a star here and I'll mention it in a second. Um, Hartree-Fock and density functional theory are both variational methods in practice. Uh, Quantum Monte Carlo is often formulated as a variational method. Um, you will note that there is no mention on this conventional computing using variational methods of 
couple cluster. Um, couple cluster is not considered a variational method, um, just in practice. Um, the ansatz itself could be used in a variational way, but we'll come back to that a bit later. For quantum algorithms, however, um, this idea of variation of quantum algorithms is quite broad. It's any time that you're going to use something to update the parameters of your quantum algorithm. So you can think the variational part in this case is that you're optimizing parameters for some, oops, sorry, some phi tilde here would have some parameterization and you're allowed to update that parameterization as you proceed. Um, what I wanted to put on this first slide here is just some uh, very good review articles. So this review article is from December of last year, so relatively recent, three months ago. Variational quantum algorithms, quite extensive review. Um, it's not necessarily focused on chemistry, so um, there's some aspects of it. And anything you find interesting inside this talk, I would recommend that you go look at the references that are given inside the, inside the talk. Oh, um, and one note is that I used everything in the archive just so it's easier to look up if you're on YouTube or you're wherever you're at. Um, so this optimization using variational device and near-term quantum devices uh, and this variational quantum algorithms are two review articles that will cover a large swath of, of more details of what I'm not going to be able to get into in 30 minutes. Um, and just to point out this uh, paper from Alon's group, um, the variational eigensolver on photonic quantum processor was the paper that initially put forward this idea of VQE, variational quantum eigensolver, um, that really got the ball rolling on this entire idea of quantum variational algorithms. So again, um, just kind of stepping back and, and making a little more details to this, uh, variational quantum algorithms are these algorithms that you have some circuit parameters. Here we're going to use theta. Um, these parameters theta are somehow given by some class of computer, it feeds that information inside of some form of a circuit, and that circuit's executed on the quantum device. Note in green, there's some initialization of the quantum state. Uh, typically, this would be whatever the quantum device initializes to, typically the zero state or whatever state it is is normally denoted as a zero state. And at the end of the quantum um, operations that are dictated by these values of theta, you do some measurement and outcomes P1 through Pn come out. Then they're fed in. And then if you note inside this little um, mock-up of a computer, you have your, your outcome parameters through some optimization algorithm that then allow you to select the next, um, it should be K plus one here. Okay, all right, yeah. So the considerations here are that you um, want to think about what onsets we're using for the circuits. So how do these circuit, how do these datas map to circuit elements? Um, there's a lot of issues of noise and decoherence, which is very nice. So these issues of, of noise and decoherence um, are really nice to deal with inside of a variational setting because you can adjust these parameters to take into account any noise that you're able to mitigate. Moreover, you can do a lot of things like Richardson extrapolation if you have decoherence, um, which is basically just taking um, noisier gates for longer amounts of time and shortening the time to get extrapolation to zero noise. Um, and then there's also a number of optimization strategies. So I didn't say anything about how this computer is optimizing these parameters. Um, there's a, most of uh, the packages, so I'll talk about um, computational packages at the end, but the computational packages just use things like things from SciPy, right? So it's your standard optimization techniques. A lot of the optimization strategies that you find inside of variation of quantum algorithms, you also find inside of optimizing neural networks and vice versa. There's a large uh, conversation going on between variational quantum algorithms and neural networks, quantum neural networks, neural networks for variational quantum algorithms, and a lot of things about machine learning that I didn't want to get into during my 30 minutes. So I will not. Okay, so there's a lot of things that can happen with this. Um, and what I want to start off with is just some flagship experiments. So these are a whole list of experiments over the last few years. Um, if you know, none of these are from 2020 or 2021. Um, the reason that uh, there aren't many experiments in 2020 and 2021, listed on this slide anyways, is that um, around 2020, there's a lot of quantum devices that are freely available. So there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of implementations of different quantum chemistry methods of these uh, potential energy curves that have been implemented on different types of hardware, but usually through someone who's not actually building the hardware. I highlighted these because these are what I would call flagship experiments. So this Peruso um, experiment was the original one that kicked off this idea of doing uh, variational quantum eigensolvers in the first place. More recently, quantum ions, um, so ion trap experiments from IonQ and from Rainer Blatt's group um, in Innsbruck. Uh, then there's a number of superconducting qubit experiments that have been done 
um, at IBM, at um, the National Labs, and at uh, Google. And if you note, all of these um, images, except for this one, are all of potential energy curves. So this is the potential energy, the electronic energy. So you fix the nuclei at some fixed coordinates. So here's a nice picture. There's some distance between these two, um, these two, and that's denoted here, the interatomic distance. It's the same bond length here, atomic separation. These are all the same idea. And what happens is at some minimum value, you'll be at the ground, you'll be at the minimum, you'll be at the minimum, and that is what we consider the equilibrium bond length. Um, what's also very important about constructing at least the curve close to this value is that this also dictates the vibrational structure of this molecule. So how much does hydrogen and lithium vibrate together will be dictated largely by how tightly confined this well is. So if you know this is a very tightly confined well, and if you go to this excited state in orange, there's no well here. So if you had some state here, it would just continuously feel a force pushing it to separate. So this is what people are thinking of using quantum computing for. Um, I'll have some comments about why this may or may not be the best idea. Um, these are all heuristics, and, and that's really what this entire talk is about. And I'll give some comments and heuristics towards the end. Okay. Um, right. So in, in all those uh, experiments that I mentioned, I didn't mention anything about the onsets. Um, so far, I just mentioned that there exist onsets. Um, and one of the most important onsets for quantum chemistry is this unitary couple cluster approach. So it's unitary so that you can implement it on a quantum computer. Um, and the idea is that we have these cluster operators we excite from some occupied state to some unoccupied state. And this is the T1 excitation operator, so you're only exciting one electron at a time. T2 excites two electrons at a time. T3, three electrons at a time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These operators follow the fermionic algebra. Consequently, they do not commute. Um, in fact, they don't commute um, also means that you have to implement a trotterization to actually implement this U of theta um, xt minus t, t dagger. Um, but it turns out this trotterization is not necessary. So it's a very um, nice paper, I forgot to put the names, but this is um, from uh, um, 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 Garnet Chan, Evangelista, uh, uh, and, um, and uh, Gus Sussiera, where they looked at a very nice analysis of the couple cluster wave function and realized that you don't actually need to do trotterization if you put this operator, so e to the t1, e to the t2, um, in, in all the different components of it, um, instead of actually doing anything to reorder them to try and put in higher order trotter approximations, you can actually just use the disentangled unitary uh, couple cluster and actually just reorder. And it actually has enough parameters that you can actually represent any state that you could have represented with the unitary couple cluster with the disentangled unitary couple cluster. That's not to say that it's as easy to optimize, um, but this is at least some of the recent work that's going on inside this direction. The generalized unitary couple cluster is a much older idea that goes back to um, when people were really initially thinking about couple cluster and how flexible is this onsets, where you have this exponential of these uh, creation annihilation operators. This generalized UCC includes, instead of just um, occupied to virtual, includes virtual, virtual, and occupied, occupied excitations. Um, there's sufficient number of parameters, but this is not a full onsets. However, it not being a full onsets will actually come in handy um, for many of the optimization techniques that we'll discuss a bit later. Uh, finally, there's a qubit couple cluster method. This is from, um, also from Canada, Toronto. Um, the author, is, author Ismailov's group um, realized that instead of doing anything with fermionic operators, we could just use poly operators and just enforce the fermionic, um, the fermionic statistics at the end. And so this also has a lot of generalizations that play well with the other ideas that people have thought of in terms of unitary couple cluster. So this entire slide, everything except for the, the parts at the bottom, are all about um, uh, onsets that are about unitary couple cluster onsets. However, there's layered onsets, and this should be an E there. But for layered onsets, the idea is that I have one unitary I'm going to apply that will be of one type, and another unitary of a second type, and I will alternate these back and forth. The quantum adiabat approximate optimization algorithm, I didn't put much here. Um, it's not as widely discussed inside of the context of quantum chemistry, but this also shows up inside of optimization algorithms more broadly, and also a lot of theoretical work has been done on um, quantum approximate optimization. 
most of the theoretical work coming into um, variational quantum algorithms from the quantum chemistry community. So all three of these papers are from quantum chemists, um, the Head Gordon group, um, and, and the, the Toronto group here. Um, all these ideas are really doing this unitary couple cluster where you might have some layered um, aspect to it due to the trotterization. However, this layered on such for the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, you're really swapping between two different Hamiltonians and you're applying different lengths of time for these different operators. Um, this Candela paper, which we've already mentioned earlier, which was the IBM flagship experiment, uh, and this is actually from the same paper, is this idea of a layered on such where you have some, some set of single unitary, um, single qubit unitaries, and then followed by some entangling uh, unitaries, and then you have another set of, uh, and you just repeat, alternating between single qubit gates, um, entangling gates, single qubit gates, entangling gates, so on and so forth. To get to the end, you do the measurement, and this is just another way of representing an ansatz for how you might put information into a quantum computer. Okay, the couple, unitary couple cluster, just to, just to highlight this one more time, uh, the couple cluster method is a very important method inside of classical computational chemistry. It was not listed as a variational method. It's not listed as a variational method because um, typically, you have to compute the couple cluster amplitudes using a projective method. Um, there is a notion of this that's been generalized for the um, unitary, for, for general, uh, which I'll mention a bit later, actually, uh, coming up. Okay, so one very important thing about all these unitary onsets is that if the unitary onsets is flexible enough, um, so it's sufficiently random, so a two design means that it matches the hard distribution up to the second, um, second, moment, yes, um, to the second moment, um, then what happens is as you increase the depth of that onsatz, the gradients that you would use ordinarily to optimize um, your, your path through this landscape. So at this point, if you want to figure out which way to go, you can see you go down this way. Okay, maybe you're stuck here for a little bit. You come here and you see you should go down more until you get to this is very nice minima here. And you could do this with any sort of steepest descent, gradient descent. Most of the methods you might naively think of would work for the landscape at the top. However, landscape at the bottom, you really have no real hope of figuring out where to go. It's completely flat, and so if you start here, you have no idea to go here, and if you find this minima, well, this is not the global minima. This is the global minima, and this is how you should expect that most of the unitary onsets, if you give them um, sufficiently random, uh, random initial states, and they have enough flexibility to capture the hard distribution, then you should expect that these gradients will vanish. You can use local operators to delay the onset of the barren plateau, um, but the noise inside your quantum device can induce it. There's been a lot of study of these phenomena in barren plateaus over the last few years, and I'd recommend, if you're interested in learning more, to start with that variational quantum algorithms uh, review article, which has a, quite a nice discussion of barren plateaus, different uh, reasons for them, um, different strategies for mitigating them and avoiding them, um, which I'll talk about a little, a few of. So um, there's a lot of ways of avoid, avoiding these barren plateaus. And if you think of the barren plateau, it's really a consequence of having too flexible of initial state, too flexible of an onsatz. So you can either break the flexibility of onsatz or break the flexibility of the, um, or, yeah, break the flexibility of the onsatz or pick an intelligent initial state. Um, and so I listed some examples here. So this is one of the earliest examples of restricted initializations to avoid barren plateaus. Here, you're trying to build a unitary that's close to the identity such that the gradients remain large for as long as possible. Um, this adaptive PQE algorithm, which I mentioned, I, I said I would mention, um, this P is for projective, and this is a um, quantum eigen solver. But this projective quantum eigen solver is essentially taking the classical method for finding the couple cluster amplitudes and turning it into a um, quantum, uh, into a, an adaptive quantum algorithm. So this adaptive uh, PQE algorithm and this adapt PQE, both of these are built around this idea of setting up, um, you set up your integrals, then you have some operator pool. This operator pool is just some set of operators that you might use to optimize the circuit. Um, and then you would exponentiate each AK with some theta K. And the idea is that by, by measuring this commutator, this commutator acts as a, as a derivative um, well, this is similar to the derivative, so this is the derivative of the energy, missing an E here. But um, the idea is that by measuring these, I can select which ones are the most important to include, and then I will expand my pool with the ones that are, have the largest gradient, 
And this way I can adaptively grow the, the optimization subspace um, that, I'm trying to, that I'm trying to optimize over. Similar idea for this PQE, um, except more complicated, because um, you end up using projections into different states rather than having psi uh, projected into psi. You have psi projected into some orthogonal um, element, and this is typically how um, people approach uh, the couple cluster method. Um, at the top, so the presentation is a little backwards, but um, at the top we talk about pre-diagonalization. So there's a couple of different methods to do this. So the first one is dynamical self-energy mapping met approach. Um, there's a number of approaches that are in this vein of hybrid quantum classical algorithms that really think about how to um, hybridize the effort um, using self-energy using Green's functions. Um, in this paper, what they do is use a Green's function approach to try and diagonalize a Hamiltonian that they put on the quantum computer to help um, ease the optimization. A similar idea is inside of this uh, Komeao paper from the National Labs, um, Los Alamos. And what they're thinking about there is a variational Hamiltonian diagonalization for dynamical quantum simulations. You have some difficulty diagonalizing your Hamiltonian. If you could diagonalize it, you'd have some simulated transform that includes all the eigenvectors. You'd have some um, eigenvalues, and then you can exponentiate this very easily if you had the eigenvalue decomposition. So the trick inside this paper is to effectively use a variational quantum algorithm to try and diagonalize, pre-diagonalize um, uh, pre the unitary operator such that you can just do the diagonal part easily, and then you somehow enable fast forwarding for dynamical quantum simulation. This again um, is a parameter reduction, but these parameter reductions are in terms of um, diagonalizing an operator effectively using the variational quantum algorithm. So um, next thing I want to talk about was just quantum classical interfaces. So in the talk, the title was quantum classical interfaces. There's a lot of quantum classical interfaces. And what I wanted to list here was not just quantum classical interfaces. So notably, there's a few that aren't here. Um, orchestra, for instance, um, cube rate, for second example. But what I picked here was the ones that had up, uh, that had really nice working examples that fit very well with what we're talking about inside this talk. So inside the quiz kit textbook, there's VQE for molecules, is variational quantum eigensolver for molecules. PyQuil has VQE in this quantum approximate optimization algorithm. Um, Microsoft's QSharp is interfaced with um, Northwest Kim quite nicely. Um, TensorFlow Quantum has a really nice tutorial on barren plateaus. So if that's of interest to you, you can actually go um, and actually test out the entire theoretical setup for the barren plateau paper um, inside this very nice tutorial by TensorFlow. Uh, Xanadu has tutorials also for VQE. Um, uh, Brockett uh, from Amazon also has a VQE tutorial. Um, and what I have listed on the right-hand side are your conventional computational chemistry uh, packages and the ones that have been um, really highlighted for quantum interfaces. PySCF is a very nice code from Garnett Chan's group um, that actually plays very well with a number of these. It's a very nice package that, that has a pretty nice interface, um, and it's been used for a number of quantum interface, uh, quantum uh, packages as backends. Uh, Sci4 similarly also has a nice Python interface, which also allows it to play well with a lot of these packages. So if you know Python, you actually get away with a lot of things as far as getting started. If you don't know Python, then perhaps QSharp or Northwest Kim would be nice places to start um, if you know some more, more technical languages. But these are all places that I would suggest continuing your thoughts and ideas on, on variational quantum eigensolvers and hybrid quantum classical interfaces. I mean, with the idea of this being a near-term workshop, um, the idea is that one should be able to get started in the near term. Right? So there's a lot of tutorials to help you get started in the near term. Um, the last thing I would like to touch base on is this notion of computational complexity, the worst case computational complexity. Um, so classical optimization in general is an NP-hard problem. And by NP, I mean non-deterministic polynomial. So uh, the canonical example I like to use inside of my talks of an NP-hard problem is if um, I'm given a phone number um, and someone asks me what the name is, this might take me a very long time to go through the phone book to figure out what the name might be. But when I figure out what the name is, I can tell someone else and they can check very quickly that I got the answer right or that I didn't get the answer right. And so that's the notion of NP-hardness is that uh, the non-deterministic polynomial is that there are problems that are easy to check um, but may not be easy to find the solution. 
And so classical optimization, you can ask the questions along those lines. You ask, is the energy above or below some, some value? And if you say, well, it's below this value, well, you can give me a very easy hint by saying, well, this is the state, these are parameters you should put in, and you'll see that this is the correct state. Um, however, this is the classical optimization for classical optimization algorithms for, um, I don't know, max cut uh, or any of these sort of uh, traveling salesman problems. These things aren't typically um, used so often inside of quantum chemistry. But a more concrete example of classical optimization that would be generically NP-hard um, would be Hartree-Fock optimization. So the Hartree-Fock problem, um, you need to optimize over all possible orbital rotations and very similar to BQE. Uh, and in fact, there was a paper um, from the summer, spring, last spring, um, by the Google group that was using Hartree-Fock with quantum resources. However, the optimization strategy that they used was completely classical, so the problem remains NP-hard. However, if we're thinking about using a quantum device, it's not just an optimization problem. Rather, we have a quantum device on the end of that optimization problem, which means we're trying to prepare an optimal quantum state. This should be optimal quantum state here. So preparing optimal quantum states is what's called quantum Merlin author. So Merlin is a magician. He can produce some quantum state. Author has a quantum computer in his back pocket, hence quantum author. An author can then check whatever quantum state Merlin's giving him. Uh, theoretically, the protocol is normally framed around phase estimation. So Merlin gives him some state, author runs some phase estimation protocol to see if the energy is above or below some ideal cutoff. Um, so in this quantum Merlin author, normally Merlin's giving a quantum state. However, what we're talking about so far inside this, this landscape of, um, of, um, of hybrid quantum classical algorithms, we're actually thinking about um, parameterizing quantum states Classically, so it's the optimal classical parameterizable quantum states is what's called quantum classical Merlin author. Um, and this is just another optimization class that just puts more restrictions on the type of hints that Merlin can pass to author. Author still has his quantum computer, but Merlin is only passing in classical hints. In any case, all these things are to say that there's a lot of interesting questions from the computational complexity point of view that are about worst case. It's not to say that these variational algorithms won't work. Um, they might work very well, heuristically, and a large part of what people are developing are heuristics to figure out how to find the ground state. In fact, that's what a large part of quantum chemistry is all about, heuristics for finding the ground state. Um, however, these heuristics that we developed here, this variational, so one of the interesting papers from this year is this variational um, quantum algorithms are NP-hard. Um, turns out that even if the quantum problem itself that we, the circuit that we actually want to simulate is actually easy. So there's free fermionic simulations. So Barbara Terhall's here. She had a fantastic paper about free fermion simulations back in the um, early 2000s. Um, and you can simulate free fermion simulate systems. Uh, so free fermions, just for the quantum chemists in the audience, is a system where there's no electron-electron interaction. So you can simulate these systems easily. This is why we like hartree fock This is why we like density functional theory. Um, so these ideas is that even if you do a free fermion system, the optimization problem is still NP-hard. So it's NP-hardness of the optimization problem. So as I was saying, the class squat part can be NP-hard on top of the quantum part being quantum Merlin author hard. So all this is to say that we talk of what quantum devices should be able to do. Theoretically, finding ground states is not, uh, is not well, is, well, I wouldn't say it's not well-founded, but it's not theoretically supported by worst case analysis. Um, I think that's the, the best way to put it. However, doing time-dependent dynamics is something that's extremely interesting to do with quantum computers because there's no way to do the simulation of time-dependent dynamics, um, well, other than with the quantum computer. Right? If you had a quantum computer, if you could do time-dependent dynamics of any Hamiltonian, then you'd effectively have built a quantum computer. Um, and in fact, that's, that's a, a, a BQP-complete um, algorithm. Okay. So in summary, I just wanted to give um, an overview of different quantum uh, classical algorithms. Um, and these hybrid quantum classical algorithms use quantum classical feedback loops. These feedback loops allow you to adjust the quantum parameters to either mitigate noise, to uh, optimize some objective, to diagonalize a Hamiltonian, to find the ground state, to solve uh, optimization problems. This variation of quantum algorithms, um, this is a rapidly growing area of research within quantum computation and within the quantum chemistry community. A lot of the work that's going on inside of JCP, inside of PCCP, inside of all these um, um, physical chemistry journals is thinking about how do we actually take variation of quantum algorithms and understand what the limits are 
where they can be used, and even the questions that we heard this morning uh, about which algorithms were preferred for BQE and which algorithms were preferred for um, completely fault tolerant simulations. I think that question is very tricky because, in some sense, neither of them um, is guaranteed to give you a correct answer for the ground state problem. And so there's many theoretical and technical hurdles that remain, barren plateaus, thinking about um, the noise, actually building the device large enough to do something that's, uh, that, that can be called quantum supremacy, or better yet, quantum enhancement. We actually want to improve quantum chemistry um, using quantum computers, right? So we want to enhance what we have. We don't need a quantum computer that can do something that we can't do classically. We want a quantum computer that can help us do something classically better. And that is my talk. So uh, I'll leave it here for questions, and I want to again thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, to uh, to give this. Well, thanks, thanks, James. That was that was excellent. That was uh, incredibly pedagogical. Um, like, yeah, I think you really nailed it. Um, I think we've got a couple of questions already in the. I see one in the Slack. I see two in the Slack. I also see one in the in the chat here. Uh, maybe I'll just go in order because we've got. A, I think we've got a bit of time, especially if we um, allow ourselves to the extra five minutes that we took at the start of your talk. Um, so let's start with uh, one from Yaroslav. Do you want to, Yaroslav? Do you just want to like speak in the chat? If you can unmute yourself. Oh, you've got it right here. I guess James, you're sharing the you're sharing the screen. So why don't you just? Uh, I guess uh, right, Yaroslav cool. start the chat. Uh, and you know, in the um, so just to answer the question that's here. Yeah, I guess. It says, yeah. Uh, with UCC onsets for VQ, what's the source of quantum advantage to the ground state? Um, so the, the quantum advantage for the ground state simulation, this is what I was saying at the end, is that there's no promised advantage, right? I mean, hopefully there's an advantage because you're using quantum resources that perhaps you can deal with larger systems, but it's difficult to say that, um, to say that we have promised that quantum computers can do something, right? Um, Okay, and then there's, okay, I got a couple questions here. Okay, so that's my first comment there. Singles and doubles for the first quantum advantageous demonstrations or in a high order may be necessary. So the paper that I mentioned in the middle of the talk that was uh, looking at this disentangled um, couple cluster, this is a really nice paper because they do a lot of analysis of what do you actually need to have a complete um, description from a, a couple cluster point of view. So you can have couple clusters. So I mentioned this um, couple cluster we generalize that you allow virtual virtual and occupied occupied excitations. When you allow this, you actually don't have enough degrees of freedom to actually capture all quantum states. However, it makes the optimization easier because you perhaps avoiding barren plateaus and things like that. Um, and so I don't actually think you need to go to higher orders, but I would say check that paper. It would have a much better technical description as well as the proof, right? I mean, more than just what I think, there's a proof uh, involved. Um, okay. Adapt VQE, spoil the surfaces. Uh, one could print it through onsets. Someone else answered this. So we'll take yeah, I think Sophia's, Sophia's given an answer, but uh, if you want to you comment on yeah. that as well. Well, it's Sophia's paper, right? So it's her work. So <laughs> <laughs> what she said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I tried to give a survey of all the work of all the people who I thought were doing interesting things. Um, Nathan asked this question about error mitigation, choice of Bravi Katev, Superfast, and Jordan Wigner. So this is a really interesting question because Nathan's talk was on fault-tolerant quantum computing. So with fault-tolerant quantum computing, um, the most interesting part of it is, is that when we go to fault tolerance, we really start using um, error correcting codes, start using surface codes, start using these things. A lot of the language that you use to describe topological um, topologically protected quantum states is really in terms of Mariana fermions, in terms of fermionic language, right? So typically what happens is you formulate the error correcting code in terms of Mariana fermions, and then you might convert the Mariana fermions back to qubit operators. But in principle, you actually, the, the cost of simulating fermions and simulating qubits at the fault tolerant level is actually negligible. Um, you can think that um, the, all the long range entanglement of the system has already been generated in generating the protected state in the first place. Um, Jordan Bigner seems like it would be the most useful for near term, just because it's the easiest conceptually, the easiest to get started with. Um, there's also some arguments why Jordan Bigner might be better from Milan's group from a long time ago. Actually, I don't remember the paper is, but in Jordan Bigner, you typically work almost exclusively inside the Sigma Z basis, which means that if you have uh, you switch to Brabikatev, Brabikatev super fast or any of the other methods, you start using Z, X, and Y. And so this can allow decoherence mechanisms that will actually mess up your state more likely in many instances. Um, and so, 
Yeah, and so the Brabagatev Superfast has some ideas for doing error mitigation. However, the error mitigation is not necessarily short term, um, a short term option, right? So I think it's it's not clear that, that that will be something we'll be able to do in the next two or three years. But we're working on it. We'll see if we can do it. And um, yeah. Um, all right, great. Thanks, James. That's uh, great answers to the questions. I guess I mean it's so that we can um, so we can give if, we, if we've gone through the questions so that we can give everyone uh, like an hour's break before we start the the next um, the next talk. I'm going to 